Okay, so next, let's talk about eye patterns. We're on page 70. And it says, yeah, the eye patterns below are as you look at your client. And so this is for a normally organized right-handed person. If it was a left-handed person, then we call, typically call them reversed organized. And so all that will be is the eye patterns will be swapped with a constructed column on the right-hand side and the recalled column on the left-hand side. So as you look at the person at the moment, as you look at this picture on page 70, that's for a normally organized right-handed person, a reversed organized person. Literally, the patterns on the left will simply move to the right and these on the right will move across to the left. So it's like a 180 degree flip. So have you ever noticed how people move their eyes when they think or they do certain things in their head? And so eye patterns are extremely useful when we want to feed back predicates to somebody. If the person moves their head up to their VR, which is visual recall, then you can ask them, do you see what I mean? Or if they look down into their K, their kinesthetic, I can ask them, how does that feel to you? Now, most people are normally organized. And then, of course, we've got others who are reversed organized. There are some exceptions, though, and some things that we get some anomalies that we'll be talking about. So, example, a child who's had bad dreams or make up things that don't exist. So they up in their VC, their visual construct. Their parents might say, don't do that. And then maybe they might even shut off that visual construct. And, you know, over time, that actually makes somebody less creative. Because, of course, that's where we go and create, in this instance, visual. Or, you know how boys are told, cowboys don't cry, you know, don't cry. And instead of accessing their kinesthetic, you know, they might go to the AD. So what this does is they don't access their feelings all that well. You know, or they might access the AD to think about what feelings they should be having. Now, some other anomalies are like the strong look to talk rule. So I don't know if you've ever heard, you know, a parent says, look at me when I speak to you. And so that person will actually look at you when you're asking them the questions. And, you know, they might only have a micro movement of their eyes as they go access into the eye patterns. Now, we've also got people who have a strong don't look to talk rule. Example, like Zulu, Koza, Filipinos. There's, there's a number of cultures where people will deliberately not look at you when they speak to you because it's out of their tradition or their beliefs. And by looking directly at you, you know, it comes across as rude. And so they will deliberately look away. Now, there's some other people who might just defocus. And so it looks like they're looking at you, but they're just defocusing. It's almost like they're actually noticing the picture or the information just a little bit away from the front of their face. So in between, you know, your head and their head. So they may defocus. And this can be for any representational system, not just for images. Now, before we elicit eye patterns, we want to first do a tracking exercise. So we want to make sure that the client's eyes can actually move in all of these quadrants. And so we will ask the client to look directly ahead and we take our fingers and bring it up above the client's eyebrows. So the client has to actually look up past the eyebrows. And then you move your fingers in a relatively wide arch around their face wide enough that actually the eyes have to move to be able to follow your fingers. Because if you just do it directly in front of the eyes, then the eyes probably won't move. But so wide enough around the head so that the eyes actually have to move to track your fingers. And the reason we do this is let's say somebody had an accident and maybe the nerves or muscles in the eyes got damaged. And so now the client's eye can't actually move example into their kinesthetic you might think oh this person is out of touch with their feelings but in actual fact it's because the eyes can't move down into their kinesthetic because of the 
trauma. So we just want to test that as well before we actually do the eye patterns. So let's look at our little man here. So on page 70, if I ask the client a question and they move their eyes to my top right or to their top left, they're going into visual recall. If they look to their horizontally to their left, it's auditory recall. And down to their bottom left is auditory digital, so self-talk. If they look up to their right, visual construct, horizontally to their right, auditory construct, and down to their right, that'll be kinesthetic. Now remember, this is, I said, a normally organized right-handed person. Now it's important to remember, just because somebody is writing with their right hand, doesn't mean that they actually are right-handed. So years ago at school, certainly when I was at school, if there were children writing with their left hand, then the teacher actually might have smacked their left hand and said, write with your proper hand, write with your right hand. And so a lot of people have actually been forced to write with their right hand, even though they are left-handed. So don't assume just because somebody writes with their right hand that they're right-handed. Now you may also think that, oh, I can look at where the person wears their watch. And whilst that will be pretty accurate, I wouldn't make a rule out of it either. Now if I was going to look at a normally right-handed person, my watch is always on my left arm, which makes sense because I go down to my auditory digital to ask myself, what is the time? However, ladies as an example, sometimes get gold rash or, you know, you might get some form of rash and you might move or for some other reason, you might move your watch to the opposite arm. So don't make an assumption just because the watch is on a certain hand that the person is left or right handed. So it's really useful to actually do the eye patterns and we can do this by asking a client a number of questions. Now sometimes people say, oh, but I couldn't do this in a business environment. Well, when you do a pre-frame, then you can get away with almost anything. So in a business environment, I might say to my client, client, I'm going to ask you some questions. They might seem a little weird or strange. Uh, but it's so that I can serve you best. Now, I don't know about you, but most people want to be served best. And so for most clients, they're going to say, yeah, that's fine. And then you can just go ahead and do the exercise. Now, on page 71, we've got some questions that you can actually ask to see whether the client is normally organized or reversed organized. If I was to ask the client and I want to find out their visual recall, I could ask, what was the color of the room you grew up in? Or what was the color of the first car that you owned? If this was a younger person and they're actually still driving their first car, they might not go up to visual recall because they know that their car is white. Or the car is blue or whatever the color might be. So the aim of these questions is actually to force the client to go inside to go and search for the information. So you don't have to use these questions, but use a question that has the same intent, which forces the client to go inside to go and access the information. Now, visual construct, I could ask the client, what would your room have looked like if it was blue? Obviously, unless it was blue, then that wouldn't make any sense. Or, you know, I might say to the client, if they say their room was white, I say, okay, imagine it was pink with blue polka dots, you know, what would that look like? And so then I'd imagine the eyes going up to their visual construct. Auditory recall. So I could ask, can you remember the sound of your pet's voice? Or, you know, maybe they didn't have a pet. I could ask, what was the very last thing that I said? Or I could ask, what was the sound of your granny's voice? So something that forces them to go and remember sound. Next, we have auditory construct. So I could say, what would I sound like if I had Donald Duck's voice? Or what would, if they said their favorite pet was a dog, what would your dog have sound like if it croaked like a frog? So some noise, the sound that they need to go and make up. Next, I've got kinesthetic. 
And so I could say, what does it feel like to walk on the beach? Or ask them, you know, is there any specific place where they do like to go and walk? And what would that feel like as they do that? And then auditory digital. Now this depends on the country that you might be in. If they were in America, I could ask, can you recite the Pledge of Allegiance? Or you use your own national anthem, depending on the country that you're in. Or I could ask, do you have a favorite poem that you can say to yourself? Or, you know, can you say the seven times table? Now, if I do the seven times table, or any table for that matter, I normally say to the client, you know what, you can just do this silently in your head. So that if the client wasn't that good with maths, that they don't feel embarrassed. One thing to bear in mind, if I do use something like a seven times table, I might have the client actually go up into their visual recall instead of their AD. And then you think, wow, what's going on with this client? Well, in that case, the client might remember what the seven times table looked like. You know, as my children learned their times tables, they had the timetables on their cupboards. And you might remember from school having the times tables up against the wall. So they might actually remember what it looked like. So just bear that in mind. Now, they actually tried to debunk the eye patterns. And what they did is they were at the Pentagon and they asked these generals, example, you know, what was the color of the room that you grew up in? And the generals actually went down into the AED and then into their visual recall. And so they said, oh, this is a load of rubbish, you know, because the client didn't go to visual recall. They first went to AD. Well, actually, they kind of proved the eye patterns because what do generals normally do? They're really good at giving instructions and orders. And so they're actually giving themselves the order. What was that room that I grew up in and repeating the order and then going up to the visual remembered. And in this case, what they were doing, they were doing an AD VR synesthesia. So synesthesia in this case just means it's a two-step process. So they did the AD and then the visual recall afterwards. So this is how we detect eye patterns. Now we'll talk later about why I'm actually going to use them. In fact, we've already said I can detect somebody's lead representational system through this. However, I can also utilize this example and strategies, which we'll be talking about later on in the training. When we elicit the eye patterns, we can actually sit in front of the client. So this is one of those times where it's okay to sit in front of the client. Normally speaking, we want to sit sort of 90 to 45 to 90 degrees or from our client. We normally don't want to sit directly in front of them. And there's a couple of reasons for this. One, it might feel confrontive to the client. Uh, another reason, example, when we elicit the deep love strategy, we don't want to sit directly in front of the client because, you know, the client can actually attach that deep love to you. So typically speaking, we don't want to sit directly in front of the client. But with the eye patterns, it's okay to do that because we're going to, one, do the tracking, and two, we want to see where the eyes actually move to. Sometimes clients actually close their eyes, and, you know, that's okay. It's easier, obviously, to see if the eyes are open. But if the client does close their eyes, well, you can still see the eyeballs move underneath the eyelids as well. So that's eye patterns. And we'll talk about how we can use them more later on when we discuss strategies. So I want to get nice and close to my client. And say, so just follow my fingers. Okay, just follow them around. And I just want to follow them. Don't go do them on your own. So just do that again. So... Okay, cool. Um, so my client can actually move their eyes in all quadrants. If I do detect a trauma, then you know I might ask the client, you know, <coughs> do you know, you know, anything that may have happened to you in the past, which might restrict your eyes to move in this area? And just so when I'm then asking them questions and their eyes don't move in that direction, I don't say, oh no, no, they they they, they, they can't do that. You know, something's wrong. It just means their eyes don't move there. That's it. Again, here's the thing. These questions are this way for, for the reason that they are, so that they actually give us that response. 
I want to read the question. I've got it clear in my head. And I'm going to look at my client and I'm going to ask the question. Why? Because if I did it like this, <laughs> the eyes have already moved. Okay. By the way, just as we say that, avoid emotional questions. Okay, so that's what, these questions are pretty good to, to get done what, what you need to get done. Uh, I could change them a little bit as long as the intention is the same as what the intention of each of these questions are. Okay, so um, what was the color of the room that you grew up in? Blue. Blue, cool. Did you see her eyes move? Did you see she, she, she well, she actually first went, did you ask yourself, what was the color of the room I grew up in? Yeah, so she actually went down to AD first, and then she went to, exactly what I said the generals did. And so that's actually a synesthesia. So synesthesia is, is a two-step process, yeah? or at least a two-step process. So she went doom, doom, and that's a synesthesia. But she still did what we expected her to do. Yeah? Go up and look at visual recall. Interesting, that's the example that's on Yasa. I'm not going to ask what if it was blue, because yeah? her room was blue. Fair enough. So your room was blue. What would it have looked like if your room was bright pink with luminous green flowers painted on it that glue in the dark, glowed in the dark? Not there. That's what my room looks like now. <laughs> okay. Again, her eyes went up into visual, so that that was good. She didn't quite go clearly into that direction, but her eyes went up and she was. Starting. I don't know if you noticed that. Okay. So we're happy with visual? Cool. So um, when you grew up, did you have any pets? No. Nope. Oh. You're not one of those people that say only white people love their dogs. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. What was the very last thing that I said? <laughs> cool, okay. So she didn't really have to go and think about it, did she? So therefore, her eyes didn't move. Her eyes were right there because she pays very good attention. Uh, yesterday afternoon, I said something just before you left. What was that? Neither do I, but thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so did you see her eyes go? So she... she she went to, uh, to auditory recall, and then she actually went up as if she could think of seeing us there yesterday. Was that right? Yeah. Uh, you say Fridays, you go to your mom, eh? Okay, cool. So I can, I can ask a question about your mom. Yeah. Okay. Do you remember, you know, when you were a little girl, and then sometimes maybe, you know, maybe that one time you were a little bit naughty and your mom is shouting at you? Okay. What would it have sounded like if she sounded like Donald Duck? <laughs> what would her voice have sounded like if it was like Donald? You don't expect me to sound like Donald Duck. No. <laughs> no, I don't. I was asking, what would your mom's voice have sounded like if it sounded like Donald Duck? Hilarious, I think. Hilarious, okay. She actually accessed AD. She didn't go for the uh, auditory recall. Um, I beg your pardon, auditory construct. I'm looking at them, then you, and then my apologies. Auditory construct. Uh, your school that, uh, that you were in, did you have an anthem? Or school? Uh, you did? Do you remember that? Yes. Okay. What language did you sing that in? English. In English? Okay. What would it have sounded like if you had to sing it uh, in Spanish? Yeah. <laughs> well, that's only because you don't sing Spanish. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Spanish people. I just sounded stupid, not there. Okay, so she did access that time. Did you see it? Did you actually notice her access that time? She went, again, it was so slight, she went, and then she actually went up and she went along the visual as well.
chapter uh, where we AD. I'm probably not going to ask can you uh, recite the Pledge of Allegiance because most people in South Africa are not going to know the Pledge of Allegiance. But if I had an American client, then I would ask them for the Pledge of Allegiance. No, South people might know the American television because they see it on television all the time. <coughs> maybe, maybe. Uh, do you know the words in Kosi Sikilele? Yes. C can you go ahead and just uh, recite that to yourself? To myself? Yeah, yeah, you don't have to sing it out loud. Okay. Thank you. Have you noticed her eyes? Okay, she went down there. She actually closed her eyes there for a second as well. Your client doesn't have to have their eyes open. Because even if the eyes are closed, you can still notice the eyeballs, can't you? Okay, so it's not imperative. It makes it a lot easier if their eyes are open, but it's not imperative. You know, you could still do it with their eyes closed. So, so I tend to do that a lot of the time. What, eyes closed? Uh -huh. Then, you know, I close my eyes and then... It's okay. But I, obviously, I, I, I know my eyes are still moving within there, but yeah. in order, if I want to concentrate on something, mm -hmm. hard, then I would... You're just blocking out other distractions and you're going... Yeah. Eh, whatever works for you, that's okay. Uh, do you have a favorite place do you like to go walking on the beach? No. You don't like walking on the beach? No, I love walking on the beach. It's just too long to get here. <laughs> well, I know you live in Merritt. No, 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 where do you live? in Westville. In Westville? Yeah. Okay. Um, the last holiday, where did you go on holiday? London. You went to London. Mm -hmm. where, where, what month was that? December. It was in December. Okay. So tell me, what did it feel like as you were walking in the streets of London? Fabulous. Yeah? And, and what was the temperature uh, like? Freezing. Okay. Um, eating, eating through your clothes and your clothes, your boots. I remember that. London Eye was exceptionally cold. Yeah. So you see, as she was talking about London Eye, she actually, that was exceptionally cold. You actually felt the cold there for a bit, that did you? That was because we stood in the queue for so long. Ooh, you, but London Eye, you must pre-book. Yeah, yeah, you might. Mu when you're a group of 13, you don't know who's <laughs> going to be where or what. <laughs> yeah, London Eye, you're right. You can stand yes. there for quite some time. Okay, good. So, but you noticed that her, her eyes actually went down there when she, specifically when she was talking about the London Eye. So did you notice that? down to her right, so she accessed kinesthetic. Is that okay? Oh, I didn't that cold. Yeah. So, I would suggest that she is normally organized. Is that a fair assumption? So I say, it's not an assumption, it's factual based on the information that we actually got. Is that okay? Good. Thank you very much for playing.